Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am Ravas Govindaraju. I am the head of the School of Civil Engineering, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this panel discussion. The panel session is on climate change and human decisions, and I'm looking forward to a highly engaging and interactive discussion. Uh, to get us started, I want to introduce our moderator for today, um, Kendrick Hardaway, received a Bachelor's of Science in Biological Engineering from University of Arkansas in 2018. Following graduation, he spent time working for a small startup in Austin on neighborhood level urban sustainability. In fall 2019, he joined us as a graduate student in ESE and Tripoli. He was involved in the organization of Purdue's climate strike alongside the global climate strike. His research interests include how engineered systems influence human decision making and how changes in those systems can improve human health, environmental well being, and societal resilience to climate change. So, with that, Kendrick. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this panel discussion. Um, I, like, like I was just uh, introduced, I am a student in ESE in Triple E. And uh, I'll be moderating today with Dr. Bond, Dr. Dukes, Dr. Philly, and Dr. Murwade as our panelists. If you'd each like to take a couple minutes to introduce yourselves uh, and your work and how it relates to our topic today, uh, that would be beneficial for our audience. You want to start with me? Yes. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for very much for being here. Um, I'm Tammy Bond. I'm currently at Colorado State University as uh, Walter Scott Presidential Chair in Energy and Envir Environment and Health. Um, my work started in mechanical engineering. I worked on combustion, air pollution, its connection to climate, and most recently um, I've been interested in how human decisions are embedded in what we do with combustion and how that leads to uh, the cha changes in the atmosphere and environment, and then their subsequent effects on well-being. Are you sure you don't want to come work for me? <laughs> perhaps, <laughs> perhaps. Postdoc. <laughs> Who knows? So uh, my name is Jeff Dukes. I'm the director of the Purdue Climate Change Research Center and a professor in forestry and natural resources and biological sciences. I work on how ecosystems respond to environmental changes like climate change, changes in the atmosphere, um, and try to understand their responses both in terms of consequences for the ecosystems and for people, and in turn for the atmosphere as well, and, and how the responses of ecosystems might feed back to uh, accelerate or slow environmental changes like climate change. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tim Philly. I'm a professor in Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences and Agronomy, and I'm also the director for Purdue Center for the Environment. Uh, my research really is also thinking about ecosystems, but most of that below ground. I work on soil organic matter and how soil organic matter responds to environmental stress, which includes land use change and, and also climate. And I'm also very interested in how decisions that people make about how to use their land are impacted by those environmental stresses and how policy also intersects in that. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Venkatesh Merwade. I'm a faculty in civil engineering. My work mostly is associated with surface water hydrology, and specifically, I'm interested in flood modeling and flood processes and how how we develop our land and how the climate is changing, how is that um, impacting the floods and flood uh, occurrences, and what can we do to mitigate impacts from floods. Thank you all. So as a reminder, our panel topic today is climate change and human decisions. And so as a format, uh, I've been given some questions uh, that I'll be asking the panelists, and then I've also develop some questions myself, so about 15 minutes on each, and then we'll close with questions from the audience. Um, but if at any moment there's just a burning desire to ask a question, I'm sure we can, we can answer that question itself. Um, so to start, uh, Dr. Murwade, what is, the primary, what is a primary challenge in your respective field with regard to the decisions humans are currently making? 
So as I mentioned, I am mostly interested in flooding. Uh, so there are two, two ways we can think about how human decisions are impacting floods. So one is, again, the climate is changing because of all the decisions and carbon emissions we are emitting. So that's one way, and I guess I'm sure other panel members will talk about that. The other aspect of that is how prepared we are. So what decisions humans are making in terms of how they are prepared to, to face these floods and what they will do after the flooding has occurred. So a lot of people are moving to urban areas, so that is impacting the impervious cover, which means that more water is going to flow on the surface and will cause more flooding. And then at the same time, more humans are, um, are directly impacted by all the flooding that is happening in urban areas. Um, once the flood takes place, what decisions do we make after that? So a lot of people want to live close to water, which means there are a lot of people who are directly living in floodplains. And if you ask people, do you live in floodplain, only people who pay flood insurance, they say yes. And a lot of people say no, but if you think about it, all of us are living in floodplain in some way, because at some point, all of us are going to get impacted by, by, by flooding. So what we do now and what we do after the, the, the event, I think both decisions again impact what will happen in the future. So. Right, I think I recently read a paper where it said over 80% of humanity lives next to a river or a coast. Uh, and so that falls right in the floodplains. Dr. Deuce, uh, what, what is a, another primary challenge that you face in your field with the w way humans are making decisions right now? Well, I think the, you know, a lot of what I work on has to do with climate change. And so there are um, maybe two primary ways that, that human decision making is affecting that. And it, well, there are a whole bunch of ways that human decision making <laughs> sure. interfaces with that. But if we, if we think about the, the causes of climate change, um, there are decisions related to our societal fossil fuel use and, and how much that gets promoted or suppressed by um, individual decisions, but mainly by policies, larger scale policies. And then there's also decision making, uh, or the lack thereof, related to deforestation. Um, and, you know, both of those are interesting and challenging problems that are um, intertwined with issues related to um, the status quo being difficult to change um, because of entrenched interests. Um, to some extent because of corruption, um, particularly with the deforestation issue in, um, in some tropical countries. Um, and you, you rapidly get into just really thorny issues where it's um, sometimes it's easy to see some of the, the first steps of how you get past this problem, but, um, but rapidly you start seeing uh, challenges for, for getting through the second, third, and fourth steps of, of dealing with this. Sure. So we've heard a little bit about like, decisions of people living in floodplains and how that may not be the most resilient long-term decision. Um, but and, and then, as Dr. Deuce just mentioned, Dr. Philly, what is technology uh, potentially the solution, or could it be a problem uh, for how it relates to your field? Um, so from the perspective of soil, the perspective of carbon in general, right, technology really has to be part of the solution, but in the context of policy and how people adopt technologies. Um, you can have the best technology in the world, and if humans don't want to adopt it, or if there's too many barriers, or if it's economically not feasible, it just won't happen. I mean, we know our things we have to do. We know that the population is growing rapidly, and we know we're gonna have to double our food production in the next 50 years, but we have to do that without a negative impact on the carbon balance in the atmosphere. We know that we can try agriculture that is actually more restorative. How do we get more carbon into the ground while also producing food, but not cut down forests, but not move into very fragile wetland areas and disrupt those as well? So we have a huge challenge. And technology is really one of the ways we have to approach that with more precision agriculture, thinking about different cultivars that actually have a wider range of climates which we can grow them on because climate is changing. And so really technology is going to be and needs to be at the forefront 
but also with sound policy at the same time. Yes, and uh, a follow-up to that, I, you teach a class, uh, Science and Society, is that correct? Say again, please. You teach a class called Science and Society, correct? It's a great issues class in the College of Science. It's a great issues class in the College of Science, yes. So, what are some things, you mentioned policy and how it is integrated with any technology that we have or create. What are some things that, that maybe the, that you've learned or people that have come to your class and spoken said about this? Sure, well that, that class in particular thinks about natural hazards and how do we make societies resilient to existing threats and future threats and natural hazards. But in, in terms of the, um, the context of, I'll, I'll stick with my um, wheelhouse, in terms of carbon and how policy intersects with that, one of the things we have to be careful about is basically enacting laws that might mandate, let's say we accumulate a certain amount of organic matter in soil with a certain type of agricultural practice without having the ability to actually monitor and verify that. So that's one of the biggest challenges we have is being able to look into our soils and tell how much carbon is there at high spatial resolution and look to see how much of that carbon is vulnerable to climate change, to land use change, and then give the stakeholders, the farmers, the practitioners, the tools to actually verify that for a mandate that might be passed down, let's say in California, about a certain type of community, agriculture community has to increase carbon by X percentage per year. If we don't have the technology to verify that and to do that, then, then we fall short and then there's a mismatch. Okay, thank you. Dr. Bond, this is, I feel like we've been moving slowly into what you've recently uh, been researching. So what are your thoughts on how technology and human decisions play a role in, in addressing these environmental concerns? Maybe, uh, maybe first mention how much focus you feel like should be on how we're changing human decisions and how much of that focus should be on creating these, these new technologies. Or should there even be yeah. a, a split there? Right, so I, I think your, your question is something like, should we be developing new tech or should we be working on behavior change? And I would say that one of the challenges that we have is that we've been doing those things separately. We've been inventing technologies and hoping that they are a solution, and sometimes they are, um, but when they're not coupled with what people want to do, then they are they cannot be a solution or they can even work against you. Um, sometimes we create technologies that worsen the problem, like somebody made cars and now we have mobility, but we also have a lot of CO2 emissions. And so I think the problem is, is not that we should work on one or the other, but that we haven't taken a systematic view to how does that coupling of technology which amplifies our ability as humans um, with what humans do naturally and what they can be guided or suggested to do, how does that then affect the environment, which in turn comes back and impinges on humans? I don't know if that's an answer to your question. It's more of a it depends kind of answer, which I hate. Um, but I, I think that the answer is that all these things connect together, and we have not been looking at the connections as deeply as we could. I, I feel like, uh, as researchers, we can probably <laughs> Uh, empathize with the it depends situation because there's so much nuance in these these systems but maybe a follow-up question is how can we be proactive about making sure that when a new technology is coming on board that it's fitting within the system in a way that rather than exacerbating environmental impacts mitigates environmental impacts are there quick or, or ideas that you have in that area are there quick ideas um, Nothing's quick, right? <laughs> especially when you're talking about research. So I think a couple of things can, can help us there, but I think there's still a lot of unknowns. And one is the thing that a lot of Earth system scientists work on, and, and my colleagues here are no exception, which is that in trying to understand the science of the Earth, we're working toward a predictive capability of what the Earth will do. Um, and if we're able to couple how technology fits in and how it would be taken up and that there's a lot of not just human but societal decision making there. 
If we're able to couple those into that predictive capability, then we have some ability to, uh, to look ahead at what might happen. Now, um, there are always unintended consequences, and I don't think we should be afraid of that. Those just happen. Um, but I think that one area where we could improve, um, both as, as scientists and as members of society, is learning to deal with those, rather than saying, you had a terrible unintended consequence and we are going to stop all that stuff completely and you did a bad job and your research will be discontinued. I think we need to, to bring that in as a, a moment of failure in learning. Um, and so it, it's also our, our response to technology and, and failure in learning that, that we need to work on. Dr. Dukes or Dr. or any of the other three panels, panelists, do you feel like within your field there are proactive things we can do so that uh, the way humans are interacting with your systems, it's a, a positive impact when a new technology comes on board or, or a new advancement is made. I think it's, it's critical for government to function well to deal with that. I mean, I think this is, a, in a way, a question about government. You need something that's going to be thinking broadly about how to incentivize or mandate the, uh, the future you want or at least avoiding the future that you don't want. And... Um, so, I mean, I can think of examples right now, now that might relate to that with um, you know, something like solar panels. So we've now dropped the price of energy generation from solar below that of everything else. And we can expect that solar energy is going to proliferate across the landscape like crazy over the next few decades. Um, those panels don't last forever. Right? And right now, people are already bringing that up. It's like, what, well, what do we do with all these panels down the, down the road? And I think, in a way, often this comes into the conversation because people want to avoid the transition into solar panels rapidly right now. But it is a real question that we need to think about is, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to repurpose those? How are we going to, is there a way to recycle those? Um, and so, you know, government can be thinking long term about what is the future going to look like? Can we incentivize? programs or technologies that will help us avoid future problems from the technologies that are about to be exploding today. Okay, perfect. Uh, do you two have comments? Related? Well, I just want to again go back to your question about technology. So we, we are talking about technologies for mitigate climate change, but there is also a role of information technology. So we are using a lot of data also in our work and information technology to provide. So right now there is a lot of data, but people don't have access to it in the, in the form that they can understand. So there is also a role of information technology to get all that data and provide information to public so they can understand, and that may help them to be proactive. And, and, and we need to think about the broadest toolkits out there that we have. If, if a goal is to remove carbon from the atmosphere and to slowly draw down what we've already put up, but in all future activities, either make them carbon neutral or carbon negative, right, we, we need to be thinking broadly and, and innovative. And so there's been a lot of papers out there thinking about, you know, what do we need to do in forestry? What do we need to do in agriculture? What do we need to do in industry? for carbon drawdown. And so there's technologies like direct air capture, right, that are popping up. And the technologies right now are extremely expensive, particularly with the cost of carbon per ton. And they're, they're not necessarily economically feasible. And so government incentivization now, thinking about how maybe the Department of Energy could seed this research for direct air carbon capture from the air. But then also industry thinking about, well, how, what do we do with these monomers when we get them? What can we make from them that will then ultimately produce high-value products is very important. So we need to be thinking downstream. We need to be thinking upstream in, in terms of policy, in terms of industry, but also in terms of modeling our climate, modeling our environment. They're all intertwined. But we need good government and good policy to actually do that. We, we need incentivization of the research and closer public-private partnerships and some of these things to make that happen. Thank you. And so I think we've, we've discussed a little bit about, like, okay, we've got these systems, we've got technology developing, we need to be thinking about these things. But then for just the, the typical person, I know this is a question that I've gotten from a lot of people, what are things that, Dr. Bond, we'll start with you, 
what what are things that the typical person can do right now to be more conscientious of their human decision making uh, as it relates to technology or just in general trying to decrease hmm. their environmental impact? So uh, the number one thing you can do as a private citizen to make it possible to address climate impact is vote for people who will select good people and good programs. So um, it, this does not mean that personal responsibility has no role. I'll talk about that next. But, um, but we need people who can help our society do what it needs to do because the actions that you can take on your own are not enough. And so we need to bring people along. I find it useful to do the things that people are supposed to do, in quotes. You're supposed to use a cloth bag rather than a plastic bag. Um, if you think a little bit bigger, you should think about your carbon footprint and how to offset it. And I do those things not because I think they're going to save the planet, because they won't, but because they turn me into a consumer and they make me aware of where things come from and how difficult it is. And that gives me a greater appreciation for the, the big things that people have to do. Dr. Feely, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, I have to agree, voting is probably the, the actual best thing the average person can do to actually help with climate change. Be knowledgeable, I mean, be invested in the system and, and understand um, the struggle. Um, and make sure that, that you avail yourself of the resources that are out there. If you want to know about climate change, there is no excuse. There are resources out there that can tell you everything that science knows and do so in a lay fashion. Our own government has the websites that are out there. Our universities teach in it. Try to take a class on climate change or try to restructure or demand that your university include climate change in basically all freshman classes. So there's no excuse not to know about the impacts, the, the, the potential solutions, and, and your personal and collective responsibility. So I think that a lot of it is your personal investment in the system, in the political system, but even in just the ecosystem that you're in now, let's say as a student, right, you should demand that climate change is a fundamental part of how Purdue operates. To follow up, I think a lot of the people here probably are environment, like they are aware of climate change environment, but where, so you mentioned some sources, where are some places maybe they could send their friends to, or if they run into someone on the street that's picketing for not taking down a coal plant, what, where could they send them, and, and what could they... Well, so if, if the students are, think that they are initiated and they're knowledgeable and they know about climate change, go talk to your parents, right? Go talk to your cousins. Uh, don't be afraid of Thanksgiving to bring up climate change and talk about it and, and talk about what you know, because everyone at that table is a voter. Um, so bring that message home. That's one big thing you could do. Dr. Murwadi, do you... Do you have any sources that you yourself recommend as they pertain to climate change uh, that people could access or use uh, to educate themselves and educate their friends and family? These days I, I watch a lot of documentaries on Netflix. There are a lot of good documentaries and maybe that's not the answer you're looking for, but that's an easy accessible um, place that, that you can get information on. Um, yeah, and with regards to your earlier question on personal decision, what can we do? So again, learning from those um, and my personal experience, even if we reduce meat consumption just by one meal, I think we can reduce more than 10% of carbon emissions. Um, so food consumption is a big plays a big role in, in all these discussions. Absolutely. And, and if you are curious, there, there are a couple of resources that I know of. One of them is called Project Drawdown. It's a global modeling case study where they looked at what are the 100 solutions that are here today. We don't have to wait on any technology. These solutions are here today that we could, uh, what they call draw down carbon from the atmosphere. I recommend checking that out. It's called Project Drawdown. And they mention one, in, the, in the top five, there are two related to food, and that's reducing food waste and reducing meat consumption. Um, 
Can anyone guess the, the number one thing that humans can collectively do to mitigate climate change? Yes. Uh, refrigerant. Refrigeration is the number one thing they decided uh, human society could do to reduce climate change impact. Um, Dr. Dukes, what, with all of this, uh, we've talked about voting is important, we've talked about individual actions we can do, but when we're, when we're voting, what, what should we be looking for in a, in a platform or, or in, uh, in policies that are realistic in addressing climate change? What are some examples, some enforceable examples for what we should look for uh, in terms of policy related to climate change? So I want to just back up for a second on that refrigeration point and just be, just clarify that that's because some refrigerants are incredibly powerful greenhouse gases that are very long lived in the atmosphere. And so managing those instead of just um, somehow letting them be released into the atmosphere at the end of the life cycle of refrigerants or during the production cycle is, is particularly critical. Um, but I would say that um, it, you know, the, the main thing that um, I would look at with a candidate who's, um, if, if you're thinking about climate change, is whether they talk about climate change a lot and seriously. I mean, there are many different, um, there are many different proposals out there for how to tackle climate change, um, but uh, the political system means that many of the wild ideas won't actually get enacted. Um, but if someone is really serious about the issue and is pushing for the issue, there are many possible um, steps forward that we could take that um, that have a chance for for succeeding. And and you know, I want to know that the politician that I'm voting for is going to push for many of those solutions and for them being implemented quickly. Um, it, you know, it's uh, it's one thing to say that you're going to ban fracking tomorrow, um, that's, you know, you can make that statement, but whether you can actually accomplish that is a, another question. And with any policy, there's that same thing. You want, you're going to put in place a carbon tax. So I think, you know, one thing is you can evaluate whether you think those policies are realistic. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I think the other thing is just, is the person really passionate about the issue? And if they're passionate about the issue, then you're going to hope that they're actually going to get something done, whatever mechanism it is, um, you know, whether it's the exact thing that they're proposing or something else. So I, I think, you know, right now, honestly, um, there are huge differences among politicians um, in how they're talking about climate change and, and how I would perceive their motivations for, for dealing with it. And, and I think that it's... Um, I wouldn't worry too much about the specifics of policies among the people who, are, who seem to be very serious about tackling it and are talking about it a lot. I, I would just want to um, choose one of those people who's at least talking about seriously doing things about this. Dr. Bond, what are your thoughts on, when you're looking at uh, politicians or representatives, what are you looking for in, like, okay, that we want to vote, but then who are we voting for? What what mm -hmm. are you looking for in terms of policy or, or positions? So I'd have to agree with Dr. Dukes. If I was great at picking policies, I would be running for office. I'm not. And um, it, I am not able to predict what is going to worm its way through the political system. It's going to take some pretty smart heads who understand the science and who understand policy to put something together that's acceptable and that moves forward. A couple of things that I would look for then are not specific poli policies, but um, who, who are they choosing to advise them? Um, are they thinking about not just policies now, which are very important, but long-term investments? The, the price of solar cells that we have now, which is enabling people to, um, to get solar energy at a reasonable cost, came after years of research and development into solar cells. And so, in addition to needing to move quickly, we also need to, to think big and long because the things that will enable us to have um, a lower impact in the future are just glimmers in somebody's eye right now. Um, and so, I'm looking for smart choice of people, um, willingness to move quickly, but also not so quickly that you're not looking for long-term investments because some of what we would like is 
uh, big infrastructure, big programs, things that help us do what's right. Thank you. So, and, and I think uh, a lot of climate change, because it's a global problem, but then every location is a little bit different with what issues they're facing or what, what maybe they're contributing to climate change, it does need to start maybe at a local level and then, and then work toward the top in terms of what we can do and how we're involved in our community. So maybe, uh, Dr. Philly, what's something that as people here at Purdue, we could do uh, to help the institution of Purdue uh, reduce its environmental impact? Well, sure. I mean, Purdue um, has the opportunity to make overt climate mitigation or climate adaptation statements and introduce those into its master plan. Um, we have large capital campaigns that are going on to uh, increase 400 acres on the south side of campus in Discovery Park District. And part of that is going to be heavily sensing the whole system to think about water use, water recycling, energy use, um, and the conversations are about how to actually talk about carbon use with that as well. And so getting involved in that process and knowing about what Purdue University is doing in its plans and then asking you know, overtly, well, how is that going to either enhance or you know, detract from a solution to climate change? Those are very fair things to ask of all the administrators, of, of all center directors um, on campus. How are you engaged in that process? Are you educating? Uh, produce facilities about climate change. Um, we have a sustainability program on campus uh, in, in facilities and they actively talk about climate change and energy as well. But the students can actually ask, well, what are you actually doing? Tell us about it. And, and we should be able to answer. Dr. Marwade, do you have thoughts on something that faculty or students could do to help Purdue as an institution reduce its climate change impact? So I I, I agree with everything that Dr. Philly said, but as an institution, and again, this is something simple I have seen over the years, and I find this on every campus. Whenever there is a conference during the summer, you go to that conference and you sit in that room and you're freezing cold. And I see that even on Purdue, sometimes I come in the summer when it's too hot, I come in my office and I feel like I have to wear a, wear a sweater. <laughs> so maybe somebody has done some studies, can you just raise that temperature by one or two degrees and see how much carbon uh, you will reduce? Um, um. So, so one of the things I also think about, and it falls back in the last question a little bit, is that because of our entrenchment of our political parties, um, talking about climate change across the aisle is often difficult, but sometimes they're talking about the same solutions. And if they're talking about efficiencies in industry, or if they're talking about um, how to basically capture CO2 out of a coal fire plant with technologies that are also the same technologies of direct air capture, and they work actually together sometimes, but more also behind the scenes. Um, but talking about the same solutions that can be applied. And so that's also something to look for. Um, because our system is such right now that, again, climate change is a very difficult thing for one of our political parties to talk about. But they do talk about actually things that actually can improve our ability to mitigate climate change. Right. And it hasn't always been that case. I think it was the 70s and 80s that it was both parties were, were very on board with climate change and energy efficiency. And, even now, if, if it's framed in an uh, energy independence, energy security way, reducing energy use and, and finding renewable ways to produce energy here in the U.S. Uh, crosses the aisle, potentially. Uh, for Dr. Dukes and Dr. Bond, what are the ways that a publicly held company that, that is bound to their shareholders, what are things that we can reasonably expect them to do uh, as it pertains to climate change while answering to their shareholders? I can start. I guess it depends on the company and what their mission is. But um, let's, let's take the case that people like to think about, which is oil companies. Um, and some of them are investing in moving toward being an energy-providing company. 
Um, and I would say that, that that's not 100% true. Some of them are still reaping the benefits, of course, of the fossil fuels that are, that are in the ground. But nobody here is, goes out in the morning thinking, I really want to burn oil. I really want to turn it into CO2 and put it into the atmosphere. They just want what comes out of that combustion. And so if you recast yourself as somebody who's providing a service and you reframe the support of that service, which usually needs energy, to something that is more secure that you can get from the sun and not have to rely on digging things out of the ground, um, then you're doing well for your company, not just for the people of the earth, which is not a bad thing either. Um, so I would say that on the financial side, um, companies should be disclosing their climate risks to shareholders. Um, they should be really honest about, and, and like legally, I think they, they must be very honest about um, what are the implications of climate change for um, the value of the resources they hold, for the value of the services they provide, um, what are the unexpected uh, changes that could be coming down the road. Um, and that would include what happens if there's a, a price put or some sort of penalty essentially put on, on releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Um, that's, uh, the, you know, these are really important risks and I think this is gonna be happening more and more in the near future. Um, and then another thing is just they should be um, releasing some sort of transparent sustainability plan um, that, that's going to make it clear to their employees and their shareholders what they're trying to do to solve, solve these environmental problems as opposed to create them. I, yeah, I really appreciate that answer. I think one of the, the first organizations to be aware of climate change and its impacts were insurance companies because they, they always want to know about your risk as a company or as a, as a person. Um, and then one thing before switching topics a little, I, I wanted to touch base with you all, both from a Purdue situation, publicly held company situation, there's a, currently a, a divestment movement uh, occurring at a lot of universities or large institutions to divest from fossil fuels or divest from uh, banking establishments that are giving loans to fossil fuels. Uh, what is the role of boycotting or divesting from people that maybe aren't, or companies or, or organizations that aren't transparent about their environmental, environmental impacts. Dr. Marwadi, do you have thoughts um, on the role of boycotting uh, groups? Uh, I would pass that question to my colleagues who are more qualified, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I actually haven't given that a whole lot of thought, to be honest. And uh, But the role of, of uh, public pressure on a company to do what is socially responsible is the right of every consumer. Um, and so if they, if they want to, to speak with not actually buying that product, that's, that's their right. Um, and if a company looks at how it operates and decides that enough of the society will think that what they're doing is not in the regional, national, or global interest, and people will not buy their products, I think that then they will respond. Um, but, but I haven't actually given the thought about actually active boycotting uh, to, too much thought, and I, I, maybe Jeff has. I, I have a bit. I mean, I think that the, the boycotting the stock is something that for the most part starts out as being symbolic unless it snowballs. If it does snowball, then that, that can have a real effect on the, the company, but it, also having that symbolic pressure out there that suggests that people want you to stop doing something you're doing. I mean, the, the case that's brought up is typically the case of apartheid, where that, you know, boycott of South South African um, stocks and companies really uh, did start to put pressure on a on a country to change. Um, but I, I I think that the you know initially there are, um, it, it's mostly symbolic, but it can build over time, and then you can see companies like uh, BlackRock saying we're not going to. Um, we're not going to be engaged in these businesses going forward, and that has a that has a real potential impact. So, um, so I think that you don't know where it can lead. Typically, one university's holdings within an industry like coal or fossil fuels in general is, if you're talking about university boycotts, that's a tiny slice of the overall pie, but it is a, an important symbolic gesture, and it says something to the whole student community, the whole university community, and. Um, and to some extent to the larger investment community. 
Dr. Bond, one thing that uh, a student had asked previously was, what do you feel like the way the media is currently portraying climate change? So I'm pivoting a little bit from, from governance into maybe less in governance and more of the media. Mm. Do you feel like the media is accurately portraying what the reality is surrounding climate change? Well, you're kind of asking the wrong person because I don't really watch television um, or get my news from those sources. And, and if I want to read about climate change, I don't go to the media. So I'm a bad test case. Um, I, I would say that we're not really present to the reality of climate change. We either, we either hear about it as a political uh, event. Um, it's talked about when there are extreme events in the weather um, and then people don't know how to relate those to climate change. And um, what I would like, and I'll, I'll just tell you one of my secret longings here, um, is that we'd have movies that were set in realistic climate change settings. And you would know as an audience member that this was the year 2050 and it was in the business as usual scenario so people kept burning fossil fuels. So the kind of climate change movies we have now are like the day after tomorrow, which is pretty old now, but it's also pretty extreme. But I think that people know a fair bit more about weird alternate realities than they actually do about our realities. So I don't know what the media is doing, but I, I think it would be great if the, if the arts and entertainment community got on board with sharing with the public what climate change was going to be like. So, quick question, uh, uh, thank you. How many of you have been uh, seeing news about the coronavirus <laughs> recently? Sure. <laughs> See, so, would it be fair, this will be the last question before I open it to the audience. Would it be fair, Dr. Dukes, to expect media to provide maybe uh, almost like updates like they're doing for the coronavirus for climate change? Uh, well, I would say that it would be nice to have regular updates on climate change or at least regular discussions about climate change in the media. Even I don't want to hear about climate change every 20 minutes. <laughs> That's um, fair. That's fair. But <laughs> it's a little depressing. But, but yeah, I think, uh, I mean, what are the, the number just came out that I think, and I, I'm going to get this completely wrong, but there was something like um, four hours of total coverage on the networks on climate change the last year, I think. Uh, it, maybe somebody else saw this news story and can give me the exact number, but it was something around, around that. So a whole year across the networks, four hours of coverage on climate change. Hmm. This issue deserves a lot more time than that. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's where I'm getting at is uh, climate change, part of what makes it this insidious problem is the fact that it's so easy to put out of mind. And so uh, if, if there's a way that we as a society can put it in front of ourselves more often to help our human decision making, uh, perhaps that would... I, th I think one of the things that also makes it hard sometimes to talk about is differentiating um, the things people feel locally with what climate change reality is. And, and often it's even hard for the scientists to say, what is the effect of land use change, let's say, uh, climate change uh, and urbanization on a local community? Mm -hmm. And so, again, I, th I think the impulse is to say it's one or the other, but, but they're intertwined. For sure. And so to, to basically not talk about it because oh, it's a little complicated because we have a complex system where we actually influence it and, and, and then climate change in turn influences us, we'll basically want to wait for something that's a big splash that says climate change. Um, but talking about it as this is an evolving complex system, I think has to be started too. Thank you. So now I want to open it up to the audience. Uh, any questions that you all might have about, to, for our panelists or, uh, yes. Wait, we have a microphone for you. <coughs> oh, Harsh Farzan, Eeps. I have a question for Tammy. Um, I know you've been involved with promoting distributed 
energy systems such as solar cookers and lamps and so on and so forth. Uh, my question basically is if we, sorry, oh, did I get that wrong? Okay. Uh, if we promote these distributed systems in poor societies, aren't we just committing these societies to perpetual poverty? Wouldn't it be better to invest in centralized renewable sources and have a grid and so on and so forth? Okay, let me summarize your question um, and, and perhaps give a little context for the, for the rest of the audience who doesn't have as much familiarity as this, uh, with this issue as, as you and I do. Um, and so one of the things that I have been in, involved in is uh, not necessarily distributing uh, devices to poor communities, but I've been involved in assessment of, um, of delivery of, of technological so solutions to, to people who don't have a lot of resources, particularly abroad. Um, and solar cookers were mentioned. Um, that's, that's actually not a thing I've been involved in, but I can talk about your question, which is, aren't we just condemning these people to poverty by saying, here's a solar cooker, rather than giving them electricity? Um, that is a really good question, and I think a, a couple of things there. Um, first, I think that anything that we get involved in should be about enabling people. Whether it means that they want something to cook more conveniently or they want something so they can create a livelihood. Um, I, I think that that should be the question. Are we enabling people? Um, the second question is how did we decide that they should have that? How did we decide what's best for a community? And so I think that's, that's something that we should all think about, whether we're engineers or not. As we think about changes that we would like to make technologically, we might think about climate change um, as something that we're acting against. But are we also enabling the people who are using these technologies, whatever it might be, whether it's a solar cooker or a grid connection, um, there are communities here in the United States that, that also don't have resources where we might take action and, and uh, bring in something like a new, a new program or a, a you know, low carbon technology. And um, so this is something that's kind of at the core of what I'm looking at in research now is yes, we need energy solutions, but we also need enabling solutions. And I didn't really answer your question, I fully acknowledge, but. Thank you. But I mean, if I could add a little bit, I mean, there are, so we have a large team across Purdue that is working in Peru. And um, a number of these teams are working with small indigenous communities up in the, the high Andes that were very stable, productive, um, great agricultural output uh, with, with uh, indigenous grains, but in the last 40 years have felt basically their system move out of equilibrium. The rains have changed. Um, the, the type of rain is, is more intense. Deeper freezes, more frost. And so their lifestyle, which was stable and productive and they enjoyed for a millennia, basically has shifted. And they live on such severe climate, natural climate and geographic gradients that there's no place for them to move, really. Um, unless they want to emigrate to a completely different region of the country. And so, there, th those communities are asking for how do we basically adapt? We want to stay where we are. How do we adapt? Can we use microgrid technology uh, to have a combined solar wind to power our system so we can heat, so we can dry our grains because they get wet, so we can heat our uh, um, our animal buildings basically for agri agriculture so they don't freeze, so the llama don't freeze at night, and so. I think part of that adaptation is also thinking about what the communities want as well. I think we have a question over here. So a larger chunk of human population lives in developing and developed con underdeveloped countries, but most of the technologies that we have are developed in the developing countries. And in the present world, with so many climate change treaties, say the Paris Agreement put a lot of stringent actions or carbon emission limitations on these developing countries, but the developed countries are a lot reluctant on sharing new technologies with those areas. 
So how important do you think is sharing new technologies for our shared environment? Because when the technology reaches a larger chunk, that's when it will be more efficient as compared to discussing about smaller companies in the bigger countries. So maybe if two of you want to take that question, it's what, what responsibility do sure. uh, potentially industrialized countries have toward countries that may not have as much uh, research and technology? Uh, well, I can say something, but it's going to be a terrible answer. Because that is a thing that we as a society have not figured out and we need to grapple with. Earlier on the panel, somebody asked, what can we do proactively? The question that you raised about the responsibility of people to develop technology, who develop technology to deploy it for the benefit of mankind is, and womankind, um, is a question that we should grapple with as engineers and as, as world citizens. Um, and we don't know how to do that yet because it sounds great in the context here of talking about global change to say that we should benefit everyone, but I can guarantee you that if we were in a panel with industry members, they would say, I am not doing anything that is not going to deliver a profit for my company. And that is where that division comes from. Um, technology is a solution only if it is broadly applied. And this is true, again, not just of so-called developed versus developing, but also within our own country, that the, the technologies that are, are helping us with climate change, electric cars, are available to the wealthier citizens, and yet it's the poorer ones who tend to be impacted more. That notion of division and benefit is something that we should take head on as engineers. If one of you want to comment for the next question. Um, I could turn it a little bit and, and talk about um, the role of developing nations or in middle income nations and how they're actually thinking of they need to transform within to actually generate those, those solutions homegrown. All right, so uh, go back to the project we have, have in Peru. One of the reasons why Purdue has been contracted by public universities in Peru is because the nation of Peru itself has actually mandated that the public university system transform itself into research one-like universities. So they basically gave them a mandate and in 2014 that said, um, you have these eight milestones and the goal really is to transform from a simple teaching universities where you collect knowledge and then redistribute it to be ecosystems for innovation, but, but Peruvian innovation. And Peru's economy, 70% of it, is really just exporting its national, basically wealth in terms of ore, not transforming it, not turning it into high value goods, not actually applying it to its own country's innovation. It's sending it to America, to China, to other places. And so Purdue University is being contracted to help transform the universities to become research universities to solve their own problems. And so it's not just that new companies outside the world should be giving their tech, it's that a lot of countries need to develop their own tech for their own solutions, and the research universities are one of the ways to do it. Dr. Mervati. So I just want to add that many of these innovations start at universities, so coming back to your questions on what can students do, so we have global engineering program on campus, and that program is dedicated to developing technologies and solutions for developing countries. So for students who are interested and want to do something, maybe you can get involved in, in, in the programs. Is, is that I2D? I2D, yes, I2D. Uh, do we have uh, maybe one last question? He had his hand up. <coughs> All right, Ty. So when talking about climate change, a lot of the talk is around climate change mitigation. But a big effect of climate change is, uh, or I guess, how it will affect people. And you need to think about how are we going to make people resilient to climate change. And in the coming years, and even now, we're already seeing these effects of climate change. So when making decisions about how we should 
best support people, uh, what kind of things should we think about when determining whether our technology should be working towards climate change mitigation versus climate change resiliency? And especially in areas where things like you can have heat waves where you would actually want to use fossil fuels in a sense to create air, air conditioned spaces so that people don't die during these extreme heat waves. For sure, good question. So we need to be doing both now. Um, the, the, the actions we take now on adaptation are gonna be um, important and in use and uh, relevant very soon you know, uh, it, right away, essentially. It, it, there's the uh, there's a whole bunch of climate change baked into the system, and over the next three decades, we're gonna see a lot of that change, and, and so we need to be preparing for that immediately. At the same time, um, it, you know, the, the carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere today, um, a reasonable fraction of it is still gonna be in the atmosphere in thousands of years, um, assuming we don't suddenly start sucking out carbon really cheaply from the atmosphere somehow, but but basically it has a really long residence time in the atmosphere and it's gonna be warming the planet that whole time. And so the actions that we take for mitigation today are really important for what the climate's like later this century. And, and so I think the answer to your question has to be both. We have to be working on both as uh, aggressively as we can, um, you know, starting decades ago and, <laughs> and going into the future and um, and I, I think there are, um, there are going to be occasional trade-offs, perhaps, as you as you implied. But um, but I think that's a much smaller part of the issue than just finding the political mechanisms and political will to be doing um, both adaptation and mitigation full bore um, from here through the end of the century. And I think that we are at. Uh, time, so I want to thank you all for coming and, and encourage you to attend Dr. Bond's lecture right after this. Uh, thank you for everyone that also helps set this up, Evan, Joe, Steve, Maria, Marsha, uh, and all, everyone that's been involved. Um, thank you for coming and thank you for helping set this up, Dr. Robinson. Uh, and if you have questions, I'm sure you can come up and, and potentially have uh, a quick conversation with the panelists before they run on to helping solve climate change. <laughs> <laughs>